The man who goes afoot prepared to camp anywhere and in any weather is the most independent fellow on earth. Do you want premium ad-free content? Duh. Content that's not censored by big tech. Of course. But with SD Insider, you can get behind the scenes and a whole lot more. Link in the description. Now, I don't know about you, but in my way of thinking, guys like Horace Kephart, they didn't just go into the woods for days or even weeks. They would go for months and sometimes up to a period of four years without seeing a soul or going to town. Now, I would say guys that actually lived this are probably the kind of guys that you should listen to. Now, we're about to say goodbye to winter, which means you don't have to carry as much stuff in your pack. So with spring and summer approaching, that means that you can carry less weight. Now, you may have a bug out bag, you may have a go bag or a get home bag, whatever you want to call it. The idea is that the pack is supposed to sustain you for a period over 72 hours. And I think that what's really important with this is that you understand the principles behind what you're doing. Now, when I was changing my kid over from winter to the upcoming spring, I, I pulled out this book, The Book of Camping and Woodcraft by Horace Kephart, because I basically wanted to see, you know, how does a modern kit, uh, you know, how does it translate from what these guys actually did, the guys that were actually living it. Now, this book was written in the late 1800s and published in the early 1900s. And I do wonder what would they do differently today if they had access to the materials and the technology that we have. But before we dive into this kit, I wanna jump into this book and I wanna read you a little passage right quick. He comes into camp after a hard day's tramp, sweating and tired, eats heartily, and then throws himself down in his blanket on the bare ground. For a time, he rests in supreme ease, drowsily satisfied that this is the proper way to show that he can rough it and that no hardships of the field can daunt his spirit. Presently, as his eyes grow heavy and he cuddles up for the night, he discovers that a sharp stone is boring into his flesh. He shifts about and rolls upon a sharper stub or projecting root. Cursing a little, he arises and clears the ground of his tormentors. Lying down again, he drops off peacefully and is soon snoring. An hour passes and he rolls over on the other side, a half hour, and he rolls back again into his former position. 10 minutes and he rolls again. Then he tosses, fidgets, groans, wakes up, and finds that his hips and shoulders ache from serving as peers from the arches of his back and sides. He gets up, muttering, scoops out hollows to receive the projecting portions of his frame and again lies down. An hour later, he reawakens, this time with shivering flesh and a chatter. How cold the ground is. The blanket over him is sufficient cover, but the same thickness beneath, compacted by his weight, and in contact with the cold earth is not half enough to keep out the bone searching chill that comes up from the damp ground. This will never do. Pneumonia or rheumatism will soon follow. He arises, this time for good, passing a wretched night before the fire, and dawn finds him a haggard, worn out type of misery, disgusted with camp life and eager to hit the back trail for his home. The moral is plain. This sort of roughing it is bad enough when one is compelled to submit to it. It kills twice as many soldiers as bullets do. When it is endured merely to show off one's fancy toughness and hardihood, it is rank folly. Even the dumb beasts know better, and they are particular about making their beds. This matter of a good portable bed is the most serious problem. A man can stand almost any hardship by day and be none the worse for it, provided he gets a comfortable night's rest. But without sound sleep, he will soon go to pieces, no matter how gritty he may be. Now, I think it goes to show that these guys, they took rest. I mean, this is the very beginning of the book. This is what he is saying before you even start packing. Your number one priority is to get a good night's sleep. And that is something that I see today that has definitely changed. I think my good friend Mike Simmons said it best. Some men derive value from how much suffering they can take, while other men derive value in how much suffering they can mitigate. And I really think that says it all because in this book, I mean, he specifically talks about those who go out to rough it. Instead, he encourages people to smooth it. You could imagine if you found yourself in an emergency where you had real stress looming over your head, that getting a good night's sleep is only gonna serve you better for the next day so that you can think clearly, so that you're rested physically. 
so that your emotions were at the best level they possibly could be. Now, what I did when I put this kit together is I went through the list in the book and I went ahead and I tried to replace it with as many modern materials as I could. I definitely tried to stay within the principles of what he was saying. So without further ado, let's get into the kit. There you have it, the modern day equivalent to what Kephart would have carried. Now it should be said that he distinguished between two methods of carry, what you carry in your pockets and then what you carry in your kit. So the first thing on the list was a map and a compass. Now that was the very first thing on the list. Now the next thing on the list was matches, but I think today a Bic would apply. After that came a pocket knife, and I should also like to say that he also included pliers in his kit. Now I think that today a pocket knife and a good old set of pliers would apply. I think if he were alive today, he would carry a multi-tool. The next thing on the list was a bandana. Now I carry two of them in my pocket. I'm gonna put it right over here with my Shamat. Next was a good old fashioned watch. This isn't a good old fashioned watch, but it'll definitely pass. The next thing was a pipe. Now I, I don't have a pipe on me, but uh, there was a good reason for that. If you were in an emergency, he would tell you, sit down, and smoke. If you got lost, for example, you got turned around in the woods, he would say, sit down, have a smoke break. And then afterwards, then you figure out what to do. The next thing in the kit was his belt knife. And he did specify that the knife should not be over five inches. This one is five and a quarter, which, hey, it's a quarter inch, get off me. Now the next thing's kind of interesting because it actually says flasher, five ounces. And what I think he means is a flashlight. I could be wrong, but that's what I think. If you can uh, shed any light on that, let us know. As we go down the list, the next thing was a whetstone, which I have right here, and then a pocket lens. Now, I presume that he was talking about a magnifier, but he might have been referring to spectacles as well. It's important to be able to look at injuries or bites, stings, scrapes, rubs, etc. And also, if you needed to clean your weapon, it might come in handy. I think the biggest thing would be having to read those little tiny instructions that come on things like aqua mirror. So that's the stuff that should have been in your pocket. So now we can move on down to the rest of the pack. Let's talk about shelter. All right, so when it comes to shelter, he had a nine foot by seven foot tarp. This is a three meter by three meters. So basically nine feet by nine feet. So that's what I put into it. After that, he had a wool blanket. Now I do have wool blankets, but I'm thinking that if he had the stuff that we have today, he would go with some newer materials. So I decided to go with the jungle bag just to try to save on weight. After that came a browse bag. Now I didn't have an actual browse bag, but what I did have was the bivy from my MMS or my military modular sleeping system, which could definitely act as a bivy. And it could also serve as a browse bag. Now, one thing that he did uh, mention in the book was that if you're a little bit down uh, south, you're probably not gonna have access to the spruce boughs that he would have up north. So just to account for that, what I decided to do was take a full size mat. That's a military sleeping pad that fits perfectly inside of this bivy. And I would basically have the same thing that he had. If we keep on going down the list, the next thing that he had was a mosquito net for your head. And I've got one of these boonie style military nets that goes around my hat. I have used this many times before and they are awesome when you need them. Now, one thing in this kit that I don't have dedicated, but is definitely on the list, is the ability to make a pillow. Now, y'all seen me make pillows out of, you know, accessory backs before in the past. We're gonna do the exact same thing with this kit. Now, that's pretty much it for sheltering. He did have tacks and nails and twine listed, but what I have is just a modern day kit. I've got my stakes in my, uh, my cordage inside of this bag right here. So that's gonna serve the same purpose. I just don't see the need for tacks and nails today. All right, let's get into the big tools. So one thing that a man back then would never go into the woods without would be an ax. Now he basically listed two options. If there was a full size ax in camp, he would carry a tomahawk. Now, if he didn't have access to a full size ax though, he would carry a boy's ax with a two and a quarter pound head, which is exactly what I have right here. Now, this is probably gonna make the majority of you laugh. He did mention having a pocket rifle and he specifically said 22 LR. Well, 
this is about as close to a 22 LR as I'm gonna get. Technically, it is a 22 though. What I would say is carry the biggest stick that you can wield. Now I have spent my entire life hunting these woods and I can tell you assuredly, that's not enough. But in the spirit of Kephart, I'm going to go with the 22. <laughs> Now, when it comes to cooking, I found this kind of interesting because he had a frying pan, a plate, a fork, a spoon. He had two one quart billy pots, like that bushcraft pot you got over there. And then he also had a tin cup. Now, I didn't feel the need to carry all of that because, well, by today's standards in cooking, we're gonna be doing stuff that's a lot different. What he did suggest is that you have two days food to secure your eats while you secure the game that you hunted. Now, because I don't need a frying pan and all that extra stuff to make the, the meals that are in these uh, nutrient survival kits, I don't really need all that stuff. So I just think that's kind of like dead weight. Why would I carry that if I don't need to? What I have opted to do is to bring this two quart pot, which it also has a bowl or a small plate in the top of it, if you will. Like any dehydrated meals I can prepare in this. And then I can also boil my water in this pot. Something else that he carried along with that was a one quart canteen. Now his was a military uh, felt canteen that he would carry and he would wet it down and that would keep your water cool for a little while while you're walking through the woods. I don't have the exact same thing that he had, but I do have a military canteen set right here. And just so that we're staying, you know, kind of in a line with Kephart. I also brought the good old fashioned MRE spoon. I should also show that inside of this kit, I have the tin cup. This is basically my tin canteen uh, cup, nesting cup that you know would be similar to what he had along with the canteen itself. So we can use this for preparing teas or even cooking as well. So redundancy is built into the kit. What is next, what is next? Oh yes, a first aid kit. He does list the contents of his first aid kit, but there's two items which I certainly do not have, one being cocaine and the other morphine. Although I could say if it was a, an extreme emergency and you had to uh, have some serious pain relief, that would be nice. Having a comprehensive uh, jump kit or first aid kit, an IFAC, uh, that's just smart. So yeah, make sure you carry something in your kit. If you wanna see a video on what you should put in one of those kits, Get in the comment section and I'll, I'll make that happen. Coming down further, we get to a fishing and a sewing kit. Now I have all of that inside of my watch and inside of my cash belt. He also says to have a comb, which I do have a comb that's inside of my wallet kit. A toothbrush, which we have right here. Did not say toothpaste. A tiny mirror, which I have in my cash belt and then soap with a small towel and a waterproof bag secured with a rubber band. So here I have my soap secured in a waterproof container with a rubber band to add extra security to it. And then as far as a small towel goes, well, I'm just gonna use a schmock because that makes sense. I'm sure he would use one today if he had access to it. After that, he had fly dope. A lot of people refer to this as bug dope. I can tell you that the exact formula that they used back then works incredible today. This stuff works. When I went down to the swamps of Louisiana and spent a week, this stuff was clutch. After that was talcum powder. I don't have any talcum powder, but I have some good old fashioned gold bond. Don't give monkey butt, because if you can't save your own ass, you can't save someone else's. And speaking of saving your own ass, y'all will be very happy to hear then he also included toilet paper. We don't have toilet paper, but we do have baby wipes and that will work. If they get wet, who cares? Last but not least was the two days worth of food. The way that he reasoned it, you should be able to catch a small deer, uh, rabbits, squirrels, and fish for your food if you only bring two days worth of food. As far as Nesmik's pack, he gave us the measurements of 24 inches by 26 inches. This is a 40 liter bag, which is the closest thing that I had to that. And I can get everything that's on this table inside of this pack. 
But in the book, he doesn't express in liters how much he could actually carry. Now, one thing that wasn't clear to me when I was reading the book is the addition of the weight as a whole. Because what I think he did was he weighed his pack separate from his canteen, possibly his ax and his weapon. Now, historians have added up all of the weight and they say that Kephart was in fact being true, that his pack did weigh 28 pounds. But I just don't really see how all of that is completely possible if he carried all of that cookware and then all of that food and he had a weapon and he had an ax, etc. So let's head over and weigh it out and see what we get. Okay, let's see how much this pack weighs without the ax, the rifle, or the canteen. So the pack itself weighs 21.1 pounds. Now let's see how much it weighs with the additional weight. 38 pounds. All right, so there's the actual numbers. And I'm thinking that if, if Kephart were alive today, that maybe he would replace uh, a couple items here and there uh, just to save on weight. For example, instead of carrying all of this cookware, we could take that completely out of the equation and set it over here to the side. And we could replace that with our grail, with a stainless steel cup, a spoon in the side of it. Can't forget the spoon, right? Because Kephart had a spoon, a knife, and a fork. So we replace this in the kit and we save a significant amount of weight. Now, if you wanna see me run the kit, with the original stuff, let me know in the comment section. I'm just thinking that this would be one way that you could save weight in the kit. It should be noted that Kephart mentioned nothing about purifying water in his kit, but I can imagine that the water sources that they had back then and also the strength of their stomachs probably played a huge part in that. Now, something else that we could do is today, we don't have the old growth forest that he had access to, so we could potentially take the ax out of the equation and we could replace it with this big boy silky. That would be another way to dramatically save weight as well. Still, another way that we could save weight today is we could get rid of the rifle and we could go with a handgun. We could actually replace that rifle with say a 10 millimeter Glock 20 and we're saving a lot of weight there as well. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put all of this back in the bag and we're gonna weigh the bag and see how much less it weighs. Let's see how much our new improved kit weighs. And I also included the canteen full of water and I put a Glock 20 inside of here as well. So let's see what this weighs. 24 pounds. Now that my friends is a significant difference. Now we do lose a little bit of function in there, but my question to you is, is it worth losing that little bit of function to get rid of that significant amount of weight? So the question is, what do you think? Would, would Kephart have stuck to his original list and carried all that extra weight, or would he have gone to something like I suggested on the second go round? And also, do you wanna see me run the OG kit, modern old school kit, if you will, or do you wanna see the kit that I picked out? I'm sure that we could make an adventure film happen with either kit. Do you think that Kephart's kit is good enough by today's standards? And if you could make changes to that kit, what would you include or what would you take away? One thing that I did realize from this experiment is how much guys like Kephart, uh, George Washington Sears or Nesmick, uh, Daniel Beard, like how much those guys actually influenced me today because what they were running back then is very close to what I'm actually running today. I think that it would just be plain stupid to not listen to those guys from yesteryear. I mean, those guys really knew what they were doing. I mean, could you, do you know any man or woman that could go out into the wilderness today and not see a person and not go to a store for a period of four years? I would say that that kind of outdoorsman or, or woman is going to be few and far between. Now you may be saying, what was that book again? So you could check it out. The Book of Camping and Woodcraft by Horace Kephart. Kephart gave a lot of credit to George Washington Sears or Nesmick. What I have found that I enjoy reading George Washington Sears stuff a little bit more uh, because I like 
is his approach to writing. But you may be asking, okay, well, what is a, a modern day book that I can get that has the same information in it, but with a modern twist? Shameless plug here, my buddy Chris Spear wrote this book right here, Primitive Camping and Bushcraft. What I can tell you is the information that's jammed into here is incredible. Let's take a look real quick and just show you. I mean, look at how awesome these pictures are. Everything is in nice sections for you and gives you all the information that you need for a modern world. I just can't tell you just how impressed I am with this guy. He really knew what he was doing when he put this one together. It's a great book. I can say, after having gone through the book myself, yeah, I approve of this 100%. One thing that really impresses me about not only the book, but the author himself is he works with young kids. He's a Christian and he really, really cares about his audience. So you should go online and check him out at spearoutdoors.com. You can also follow him on media today, TikTok and YouTube as well. And I would highly suggest because this is literally one of the best books that's out today that has a modern twist on everything that those guys talked about. So do me a favor, like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And until next time, Keep fueling those fires.